I want us to spend a few moments this evening thinking about one whose life was going great one minute and the next great difficulties, seemingly even to some a failure. And yet I believe the Apostle Paul is someone who's a great example for us in the work of the church, certainly a missionary in the church, one who had just a, uh, an enormous zeal for God, and that, was, that spread across both testaments, if you will. Uh, as he looked at living under the law of Moses, uh, you can read about the Apostle Paul, Philippians chapter 3, and you get a, uh, a mighty picture of a man who was zealous, who was a Pharisee, who was strict concerning the law, who was zealous above many of his own peers, and as such uh, had many opportunities probably given to him because of that. And of course he met the Lord on the road to Damascus, and certainly things began to change uh, in his life. And so this evening, I want us to look at the Apostle Paul. I want to look at an event in his life that probably caused him some great difficulty, no doubt. And yet what we find is through that difficulty, he, was, he had become a better person because of it. And uh, lessons like this are, are seemingly tough, uh, probably for any of us, yet it's a lesson that uh, we probably all need to be reminded of at times in our lives. You'll notice in 2 Corinthians that the Apostle Paul, as you read through this great letter, you'll notice that the Apostle Paul has to defend his apostleship, and he does so especially through the first, uh, say, maybe nine uh, chapters, spends that time dealing with those particular topics. There are those who were, uh, he would call them false apostles. You look a little bit deeper in the original language, and they were... Uh, calling themselves basically super apostles. So if the Apostle Paul was an apostle, then they were super apostles. So they held themselves in a higher uh, plane than uh, looking at the Apostle Paul. They thought he was weak and, uh, and couldn't speak and, and so forth and, and just didn't uh, have that much to offer. And so they prided themselves on their qualifications, being able to to be these super apostles and being able to teach. And the Apostle Paul would call them out basically as false apostles. But in so doing, he would have to defend his own apostleship. And so much of the letter is, is really that. We also find that there is a message that is uh, found in 2 Corinthians, written to, obviously, to the Corinthian church. And you'll remember that in 1 Corinthians, there are many troubles, many problems that the church at Corinth is facing, things that they're going through, uh, even so much as... Uh, an adulterous relationship, uh, one of their members, they're having to deal with that, but they've prided themselves on, on just showing forth great love and restraint. and not. But Paul says, you haven't done anything about it. You haven't taken care of the problem, and the problem is beginning to fester throughout the congregation. Therefore, take care of this matter. And obviously they do that, and so part of the message from 2 Corinthians is that they're those who have repented, those who have changed. Uh, the congregation itself for not having practiced discipline and the man who evidently had repented of his uh, sinful situation as well. And so uh, he, he, he responds to that in this letter as well. But there's no doubt that uh, there, were, there were many problems that were being dealt with and some of that, uh, because of this problem with these super apostles, if you will, these false Apostles, And so chapters 10 through 13 of 2 Corinthians, Paul will basically, uh, he'll go to war, if you will, with these uh, individuals, with their rebellion. And Paul uh, begs the faithful to forgive his foolishness and his glorying or his boasting, some translations will say. And the only reason that he is having to do such is to protect the church. And we need to keep that in mind. As we read this, his boasting in the Lord was essentially rebuking these false teachers. And so Paul then has to lay out his qualifications to be an apostle, as an apostle of Jesus Christ. This is what it looks like. And so he would talk about his situation. And so 
And I see a great deal of humility in the Apostle Paul when you look at his very character. Uh, one thing that stands out and shines to me is his humility. He doesn't want to do this. And he's, he's even apologizing for having to do this. He doesn't want to spend his time doing this. There's certainly other things that I'm sure that he would rather write, spend other time talking about, encouraging the congregation in other ways, but he's having to deal with this particular problem. And so we find then in 2 Corinthians uh, chapter 12, we find these verses and this particular problem uh, at, at the very base of it, if you will. And so I want us to read together. You will notice that uh, verse 2 says, I, I know a man in Christ. He's going to uh, drop to, if you will, third person and talk about this man that's in Christ. And we'll identify who he is in just a moment. But Paul begins, he says, It's doubtless not profitable for me to boast. I will come to visions and revelations of the Lord. I know a man in Christ. Fourteen years ago, whether in the body, I don't know. Whether out of the body, I do not know. God knows. And he says, such a one was caught up to the third heaven, and I know such a man. Whether in the body or out of the body, I do not know. God knows how he was caught up to paradise and heard inexpressible words, which is not lawful, he says, for man to utter. Of such a one, he says, I will boast. He says, so he began this by saying, it's, it's, it's not profitable for me to boast, yet I'm going to boast, but I'm going to boast about this event, this man's situation and what he went through. And we'll talk about that in just a moment. He says, and so of such a one, verse 5, I will boast, yet of myself I will not boast except in my infirmities. And that's what he's going to get to here in just a moment. For though I might desire to boast... I will not be a fool, for I will speak the truth, but I refrain lest anyone should think of me above what he sees me to be or hears from me. And so there again, I, I see the Apostle Paul speaking of this particular occasion, but doing so to give qualifications to such and remembering the fact that he is doing so that he might protect the church. And all of that's in the background of, of what we're about to read, a very personal situation that, that Paul is now going through. And so in verse 2, I think again, you, you see this, this man 14 years ago, third uh, person he uses, and I think this again shows the humility. And I think it's interesting because he's, he tells this, these revelations that he's given. He's taken up into heaven, he's given revelations so grand that he couldn't tell if, it was, if he was taken up bodily or not, like Elijah or like Enoch, or, or whether simply this was a, a, an out-of-body transport of the human spirit into the realm of God to be able to, to, to be before God. But Paul knew that it happened. He knew this was real, and so he's explaining this. But here's what's interesting. This event, he says, had taken place 14 years prior. You might have to ask, is this the first that anyone is hearing about it? And if so, why? Why would that be the case? I believe it is because Paul was extremely uncomfortable boasting, glorying, some translations will say, you might say bragging on himself in such a way, taking credit for anything that, that should be given unto the Lord. Paul wanted all the glory to go unto the Lord. In fact, if you go back to chapter 10, verse 17 and 18... He says, but he who glories, let him glory, where? In the Lord. For, he, for not he who commends himself is approved, but he who the Lord, whom the Lord commends. And so we're reminded, and Paul has stated that over and over, and he's apologizing for his having to boast about these things and talk about these things. So what happened next? And if we follow along uh, together... Again, I think you will see several things that stand out. You'll see Paul's humility in writing this, and you'll see Paul's humility because of some other things as well. And so the first thought that I think we see as we go through this, and I call this lesson, Rest Upon Me. 
If you notice from our scripture reading, unless I should be exalted, verse 7, above measure by the abundance of revelations, he says, a thorn in the flesh was given to me, a messenger of Satan to buffet me, lest I be exalted above measure. Concerning this thing, I pleaded with the Lord three times, he says, that it might depart from me. And he said to me, my grace is sufficient for you. My strength is made perfect in weakness. And therefore, most gladly, I will rather boast, he says, in my infirmities, that the power of Christ may rest upon me. Rest upon me. That's the phrase that I want us to keep in mind. And so Paul, if, he, if you will, cries out unto God, this idea, O oh Lord, rest upon me. And here's the first thing that we notice. Rest upon me when I have a problem. Paul is facing a problem. He's facing a difficulty. This thorn in the flesh that's been given to him, this messenger of Satan. And if you notice there in verse 7, he says, he tells why this came about. He had been called up into that third heaven. He had been given revelations, an abundance of revelations, in fact. And now Paul is getting a glimpse of the very throne room of God. And to keep him from being lifted up with pride, God permits Satan to afflict him. Paul says to, to buffet me. The, the word buffet there literally means to, uh, to, to, for him to beat up himself, to, to beat himself almost black and blue. Paul says that's, that's the idea of this buffeting. This was, this was beating him down. This was bad. And Paul says, I, I, I prayed three times, remember, that this might be removed from me, this thorn in the flesh. And, and of course you say, okay, well, what was it? I want you to think about it for a moment. What was it? do so while I drink water. <laughs> well, we obviously don't know. There's speculation after speculation what it might be, right? This thorn in the flesh. Some think it was the opposition of the Judaizers, the false teachers, the false apostles. Some say it was some bodily infirmity that he was given. Some say poor eyesight, malaria, epilepsy, migraines. I've read it all. There's all kinds of ideas that are out there what this might be. The truth is we just do not know. And that's okay, because if we're only focusing on what the thorn in the flesh is, we miss the point of it all. It really doesn't matter what the thorn in the flesh was. It's not that important. But why he was given that thorn in the flesh, that's the lesson for us. It was given to him to keep him from being lifted up with pride, he says, lest I should be exalted above measure. He's talking about himself being exalted, self-exaltation, if you will, being puffed up, being lifted up. Why? Because he has all these revelations that have been given to him. Paul received uh, so much by way of communication from the Lord. We see that the majority of the, the New Testament was written by the Apostle Paul, right? Because these revelations were so great, because of this, this opportunity to be able to see in the very throne, uh, throne area of God, if you will, because he saw Jesus even on the road to Damascus. Now he's given this thorn in the flesh. Why? To keep him humble. To keep him humble. And remember, if, if you start trying to backtrack and you think back 14 years, what you begin to realize is this is before any missionary journey had taken place. When we think of Paul receiving such awesome revelations from God, maybe this is then for his own good. Here was a man about to face enough hardships that would break the strongest in their faith. These hardships would have destroyed most people's faith and would cause most people to want to quit, but not the Apostle Paul. Do you think that possibly Paul was given a, a greater view of glory to come? Maybe because also of what he was about to go through. If you go back into chapter 11, verses 22 through 33, you can read about the, the beatings and the shipwreck and the left for dead and the betrayals and the heartaches and the daily stress of the, of the kingdom, if you will. All of those things Paul was feeling upon him. Those things that he went through on a daily basis. And so the question comes to us, 
Have we ever faced any problems in life that would compare to such as Paul has gone through? Well, there are some things that are pretty bad. Some things that are so difficult. Some things that rock us to our very core, right? Some things that we go through, it may not be a list like the Apostle Paul has, and yet they're still to us the biggest things that we've ever faced in life, right? The most difficult things. I wonder if God takes measures to humble people today to prevent them from being so lifted up with pride. You might even say spiritual pride. To such a point that they would, so that they would not lose their own souls. Is it possible then that God would humble us, as in the case with Paul, with bodily infirmities, trials, sicknesses, long and lingering diseases, great poverty, reducing one from a status of affluency to, to maybe even losing their job and then having nothing? Someone suffering the, uh, the, the slanderous nature of of others around them, someone speaking out against them in such a way, a lack of success, maybe financially speaking, or business speaking. Now what we need to understand, make something clear here is, does God do this to individuals, or does He allow this to happen? Paul says, there was given me a thorn in the flesh, the messenger of who? Of Satan to buffet me. Notice it was Satan that was causing the pain. Satan was causing this humility, this distress that he's going through. God does not punish us by inflicting us with pain or sorrow, but he may allow it, he may permit it to happen as in the case with the Apostle Paul. And you think about the case with Job in the Old Testament, much was the same. So, what do we do when struck with such problems as this, when such difficulties arise? How, how do we handle this? What gives us the strength to remain faithful in Christ? Well, when we think about what Paul was facing here, he was facing a problem. And so, Lord, rest upon me when I have such a problem as this. We might continue that, that prayer, that cry unto God in our prayers. Lord, rest upon me in my prayer. And what I mean by that is what Paul did. He prayed. He prayed three times that this would be removed from him, right? Take this away from me. God, please take this away from me. God, please take this thorn in the flesh away from me. He cried out to God in prayer, not once, not twice, but three times for it to be removed. I think it's also worthy of our consideration when you think about our Lord in the Garden of Gethsemane. Again, similarly, responding the same way, Matthew 26, 39, let this cup pass from me. God, if there's another way... Let let this cup pass from me. God, please, if there is yet another way, let this cup pass from me. And what did he say each time though? Nevertheless, not my will, but your will be done. So what do we do when we have these great afflictions, these hardships, these difficulties to hit us? What if our problems, what if our trials and temptations... Uh, come and, and, and I, I, I try to exper go through the, those experiences and, and yet I never reach out to the one who has the power to help me. The one who truly has the ability to take this from me. I think about Paul. I, I think about what he's going through and, and, and the in going through these things, and, and yet, what did Paul write in some other places? He, he, would, he would get to a point where he could say, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. Philippians 4 and verse 13, favorite verse of, 
of many of us, right? At least one we know very well. But Paul had already also said in that same chapter, be anxious, be stressed out, be panicked for nothing. But by prayer, with supplication and thanksgiving, let your request be made known unto God, and the peace that passes all understanding shall guard or keep your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus. Philippians 4, verses 6 and 7. I wonder, like the psalmist calls out, hear me when I call, O Lord, the God of my righteousness. You've enlarged me when I was in distress, he says. Have mercy upon me, hear my cry, right? Hear my prayers. O Lord, rest upon me in my prayers. In fact, the psalmist would also say, this is my comfort in my affliction. He says, for your word has given me life. The psalmist knew while crying out unto God, God, hear me in my distress. Much the same way Paul did. Hear me when I cry. He says, your word gives me life. Psalm 119 and verse 50. Your word, he says, has revived me. It keeps me alive. It gives promise to my life. It nourishes me. It revives me. It restores me daily. It gives me life. Instead of praying, Lord, remove the trouble, shouldn't we then be crying, Lord, make me alive through your word? Like the psalmist. I want us to understand something here as well. It may be the case. We learn from this that we should not be discouraged even when the most earnest of pleas are not answered in the way that we think they should be. They seem to even sometimes be disregarded. And sometimes that'll cause us even more pain. That'll cause us to, to begin to think, is he, is he hearing me? Is He hearing my cry? Is He hearing me when I cry out to Him? Does God, does God even hear me? You've probably had conversations with those who have made those kind of exclamations before. It's certainly been the case for me. We should not be discontent when our cries, our pleas are rejected. In either case, whether answered and answered maybe in the way that we, we'd hoped or answered but answered in a completely different way, an unexpected way, in either case, their good is designed to effectually promote that which is best for us in this life. Because anything that God answers for us is what is good for us and to accomplish His will. And so the next question, why did Paul cry out in the first place? And I believe it's the case that he wanted to know that peace. And that's why Paul could write later about that peace that surpasses all understanding. Again, Philippians 4 and verse 7. O oh Lord, rest upon me, number three, when I need peace. I need peace in my life. Paul found harmony in dealing with his problem. Again, it probably wasn't the way that he wanted. It wasn't the way that he had imagined it. And hence the three times that he's crying out for help. But Paul is crying out because he needs peace. Notice verse 9 and verse 10. And he said to me, My grace is sufficient for you. My strength is made perfect in weakness. And Paul says, Therefore I will most gladly rather boast in my infirmities that the power of Christ may rest upon me and therefore I take pleasure in infirmities and reproaches and needs and persecutions and distresses for Christ's sake. For when I am weak, then, he says, then I am strong. Did you notice that Paul prays three times? And you have to ask, why not four? Why not ten? Why did he stop at three? 
Why didn't he continue to storm heaven with his, with his prayers? Do you think that it could be that he finally realized and understood Jesus' answer? My grace is enough. My grace is sufficient for you. And so instead of continuing to pray for the removal of the thorn of the flesh, he said, I'll glory in my weakness. What kind of man could say such a thing? One who is close enough to God to know about that grace. One who has spent his time in, in the knowledge of God's Word, teaching it, encouraging others, helping others to know about the very glory of heaven. And so yes, instead of praying for the removal, now he is accepted. That he can glory, he can boast in his weakness and his infirmities. And it may be that God manifests his great, great his powers through our weakness so that his power can clearly be seen by others. Otherwise, it just looks like us, right? But when others see the fact that we're weak and we're struggling and we're having difficulties and yet to see us push on through those things and to know that we didn't do it on our own but because we're relying upon our trust in God, our love for God and His love for us and His protection for us, that's different. Paul says that the power of Christ may rest upon me. I want us to focus on that for just a moment. Whose power was it when the Red Sea parted and the Israelites walked across on dry land? Exodus 14, was it Moses? Was it Israel in some way? No, it wasn't Israel because they had already started their, their murmuring. It would just take us back. You brought us here to the brink of death. Now the Egyptians are giving chase and here we are. No, this was the power of God that opened up the Red Sea and allowed them to cross on dry ground. Whose power was it that caused the waters to close up and drown the Egyptian army? Was it Moses? No, it was God's power, right? Whose power was it that caused the walls of Jericho to fail in Judges, or excuse me, Joshua chapter 6? Was it Joshua? Was it the priest who, who, who gave the, the uh, this is the plan, this is what we're going to do, we're going to march around the city? These seven days, and on the last day, we're going to march around seven times. Was it, was it the, the loud trumpeters, or was it the people who shouted? Was it their power? No, it's God's power. He had the power to bring down the walls of Jericho. Was it the, whose power was it that, that reduced the army of God under the leadership of Gideon down to 300 to wipe out 135,000 Midianites? Was it Gideon? No. It was God and His power. Whose power was it that made the blind to see, the deaf to continue to hear, cast out demons, raise the dead? It was the power of God. And we need to remember that. And Paul has cried out and begins to realize when Jesus says, my grace is sufficient for you and in my strength, my strength is seen in your weakness. And therefore, he says, I will gladly glory or boast in the power, or that the power, for this purpose, that the power of Christ may rest upon me. That power. That's the power that we're calling for. That's the power that we need daily to get through life's difficulties. That's the power that when we're hurting, when we've come across that, that, that thing that's standing in our way that we've, we've run flat faced into this wall and can no longer go. This is the thing that stands in my way. This is the thing that's shaken me to my very core and my faith. This is the thing that's standing now in my way and I can't see a way around it. This is the thing that we need the power of Christ to rest upon us. And so it is we see with Paul. The Lord sustained him without removing the flesh or the thorn in the flesh. The Lord gave the apostle Paul power to endure through his continued labors. And I think it shows not just the power of God, but it shows 
Paul's faith in God and certainly in the power of God. Basically, the Lord was telling Paul, it's enough, it's enough that I love you. That's what we need to learn. It's enough that God loves us. My grace is sufficient for you. Sometimes we, we try to do math. I'm a preacher. I don't do math very well. I have a hard time counting sometimes. But sometimes we think about spiritual math. Preachers talk about spiritual math. And what we see sometimes, sometimes in our own lives, we see my weakness, his strength, and we think that's my power. I'll tell you, that's not it. That's funny math. That's no good math. Rather, it's my weakness, His strength, and it's His power. And when I begin to realize that, I'm no longer leaning upon Wayne for that power, for that strength. I'm leaning upon God for His strength, His power. And others can see that as well. You've probably face difficulties in life and have someone come along later after you've gone through all that you've gone through, the difficulty that you face, and someone said, I, I just don't know how you've done it. I, I don't know how you've made it. I, I don't know how you've gotten through all that you've faced. It's His power that rests upon us. Interesting word, rest, in this passage. It is the, the idea to tent or to tabernacle. <laughs> That's the idea, to, to rest. But he says, rest upon me. Paul says that the power of Christ might rest or tent or tabernacle upon me. That's the vocabulary of the Old Testament, isn't it? When you think about the Old Testament tabernacle, when God pitched his tent, if you will, with the Israelites in the wilderness. Moses had finished setting up the tabernacle, and the scriptures tell us that the cloud covered the tabernacle of meeting, and the glory of the Lord filled the tabernacle. Exodus 40 and verse 34. This rest upon me also is the type of language that Jesus used when John records in the word was made flesh, and dwelt among us. The word dwelt literally means to tabernacle or to tent. John 1 verse 14. And so literally the passage says the word became flesh and he pitched his tent among us, John says. He tabernacled among us. And so when you look back to verse 9, my grace is sufficient for you. My strength is made perfect in weakness. Therefore, he says, I will boast in my infirmities that the power of Christ may tabernacle with me, may tent with me, that God would pitch His tent with me. I don't know about you, but I, I find comfort in that, don't you? When you go back to the first chapter of 2 Corinthians and you have this picture, the God of all comfort who comforts us in all our tribulation, how does He do that? Through His power. He tents with us. And therefore He provides peace. Peace. That's what Paul was looking for. That's what he understood but this passage also teaches us something else, that Christ's power is strongest in us when we're at our weakest and fully trusting upon Him. The Lord has more need for our weakness than our strength. Now think about that for just a moment. He has more need of our weakness than our strength because our strength is often His rival. We fight against Him in our own strength. But our weakness, our weakness becomes His servant. 
And we draw on His resources. And we can glory in His power that rests upon us or tents with us. You think about what Jesus would pray there in the garden in John 17 when He prayed for His disciples. I pray not that you would take them out of the world, but that you would keep them, that you would guard them, that you would protect them. John 17 and verse 15. God's grace gives us the power to endure all things and to be at peace in times of that kind of distress in life. So what do I do in times of trouble? In my problems, I pray and I look for the peace that God offers in the power of Christ resting upon us to become that tabernacle over us, to protect us, to be with us, to walk with us, to care for us, to protect us by His power. How special is that? And that's why it's, it's disheartening. It, it, it will upset you. If you truly believe that about God, it, it will upset you when you hear the kind of statements that some will make about, okay, they believe that there's a God, but, but He's forgotten about me. He's forgotten. He's, he doesn't listen to anything that I have to say. And maybe it's because we're going about it all wrong. We need to realize who He is and what He's done for us already. And the ability and power that He has to care for us daily in our lives is the power of Christ resting upon us this evening. I hope that you would agree that it is. It may be the case that it's not for you, that you, there's some issue, something that you're working on, something that you're working through, some difficulty. Let us pray with you. Let us, let us encourage you in that way. But I hope this lesson helps to know that, that God is hearing your prayers, that God is listening to what you have to say. And if you will trust in Him, He will protect, He will care for. And the lesson that we learn from those difficulties in life, according to chapter 1, are going to be there when someone else next to us is going through some difficulty. And the God of all comfort who's comforted us in all our tribulation, we can use that to help and comfort someone else in their tribulation. And so if you have a need this evening, we're here as the family of God. Maybe there's one who needs to obey the gospel. We'd love nothing more than to assist you in that. And if you believe Jesus to be the Son of God, you'd repent of sins, confess your faith in Christ, and be baptized to wash away your sins. We'll assist you with that, but the Lord will add you to His church, to His body, as a saved individual.